Our second speaker is uh, Dr. Antonio Lascano, who is a professor of evolutionary, evolutionary biology at UNAM in Mexico City. Um, Antonio, feel free to join and pull up your slides and we'll get started in a, in a, in a few seconds. Lovely, thank you Great. so much. Well, let me start by thanking the organizers of this meeting for the invitation to be here with you today. And let me say that I'm very, very grateful indeed to Nick and to Lauren and all the associates in Georgia Tech, not only because of the wonderful science that you do there, but also because you have created an atmosphere which is very congenial, an atmosphere in which always one feels welcome. And I think that um, because all of those qualities, Georgia Tech has become a major uh, hub for those of us interested in the origin and early evolution of life. Um, so having said that, uh, what I will try to do today is to share some of the results that we have from my group uh, to get some insights from to the RNA world um, by trying to look at the properties of RNA viruses. And by no means I'm implying, this is something that will I'll repeat along the lecture, I'm going to imply that RNA viruses are primordial or that RNA viruses come from the RNA world times, but rather that um, they provide a very useful model to, to try to understand some of the restrictions that RNA cellular genomes, if they existed, may have faced uh, during the earliest stages of evolution. And uh, moreover, let me um, show a um, couple of uh, pictures that are clearly quite central to what we're discussing today. Everybody here knows that in 1953, Stanley Miller published the wonderful results of his prebiotic simulation that demonstrated that you could synthesize amino acids, hydroxy acids, and so on under possible primitive earth conditions. And um, many people do not realize, well, Donna did, of course, that just few weeks before, Watson and Crick had published their double helix uh, uh, DNA model. And um, I think that ever since there's something that we have to take into account. Any theory or any proposal, either theoretical or experimental on the origins of life, has to be consistent with what we know of the molecular biology of the cell. In one way or the other, we have to um, uh, find a way of making our results consistent with um, the actual mechanisms, molecular mechanisms that take place at a subcellular level. Now, something that I also find absolutely wonderful is that only just one year after the Miller and the experiment was published and the Watson and Crick model was published, um, uh, George Gamow and James Watson created the so-called RNA-type cloud in 1954 with the idea of trying to have an, an, some inklings about the way in which RNA was interacting with amino acids. They created in the grand old tradition of the English uh, schools and colleges a tie for every single amino acid. And one has to, uh, to underline that they used to meet, they didn't meet that much actually, at the Cosmos Club in Washington, D.C., not because it was a place of scientific stimulation, but rather because, as Crick and Leslie used to say, because the whiskey there was quite good and not so expensive. If one looks at the number of people that were members of the RNA Club, one is absolutely amazed at the quality of the science that this um, people produced, many of them ended up uh, winning the Nobel Award, but even those that did not really produced quite extraordinary results. And we have come certainly a long way uh, from these uh, horrible ties of the RNA tie cloud to the current realization that the central role that RNA and ribonucleotides play a central role in molecular biology. We know that ribonucleotides are all are synthesized in all living organisms that we have studied essentially the same way. That means that it's a monophyletic, highly conserved, ancient metabolic pathway. If we want to have RNA, therefore we have to polymerize ribonucleotides. And ribonucleotides, of course, can encode genetic information, as in the messenger RNA, or as in viruses like the coronaviruses. And the non-coding RNA, we can divide basically into groups, the large non-coding RNAs, like the ones that we see in ribosomal RNA, or transfer RNA, or the primer RNA, and the small non-coding RNAs, which actually play a key role in a number of regulatory processes. 
ribonucleotides, modified ribonucleotides can act as coenzymes, which are essential for um, enzyme uh, activity for most enzymes. Histidine is a derivative of ribonucleotides. Alarmons, which are second messengers, are indeed either ribonucleotides or modified alarmons. And there are even some antibiotics that we can derive from ribonucleotides. And more importantly for the viewpoint of evolutionary biochemistry, if we want to have the exoribonucleotides, namely the subunits of DNA, we need to have as a substrate ribonucleotides which are going to be reduced. There is no way you can overcome this step if you want to have um, in cells the synthesis of DNA. So this supports very, very strongly the idea that indeed there was some sort of uh, um, time in their early evolution of life in which RNA play a much more important role than or a much conspicuous role than it does today. And uh, there are, of course, several, many definitions of the RNA world. Quite interesting, there are actually contradictory definitions of the RNA world coming from different groups of persons. But I can say, I could say that the catalytic, regulatory, and structural properties of RNA molecules and ribonucleotides combined with their ubiquity in cellular processes strongly suggest that they play a key role in the early evolution and perhaps in the origin of life and cell. In itself. And um, the basic um, <clears throat> assumptions which, which underline the work that we are doing now in my group in Mexico City is that there were uh, RNA cellular genomes in early cells prior to the appearance to the emergence of DNA genomes. And secondly, the viruses, RNA viruses, are imperfect models, but no models nevertheless, of the primitive traits that RNA cellular genomes may have had. Now, uh, although it is quite unlikely, <clears throat> excuse me, that RNA viruses are direct descendants from the RNA protein world, uh, I believe there's the study can provide insights into the structure and evolution of early cellular genomes. And that will include the restrictions and the properties of genome sizes and organization, the replication strategies, the mutation and evolutionary rates, and the way genomes uh, grow, the way genomes can enhance their encoding properties. Now, one basic trait of RNA genomes, we are all fully aware of this because of the current pandemic, is that due to the lack of proofreading and repair mechanisms, RNA viral genomes typically have an error-prone replication. Typically, the rate of point mutations is one million higher, that times higher than what we see in DNA systems. And this uh, translates or this results in extensive genetic variations in rather small sizes, because because of course, if you have too many mutations, you cannot keep the genetic identity when you are replicating replication. We see different genome organization strategies in different types of RNA viruses. And of course, this translates into a number of um, adaptive uh, constraints. Now, if we want to try to find out the evolutionary history of um, RNA genomes, one of the first problems that we immediately have to cope with is a uh, error-prone replication, which means that um, the reconstruction of the evolutionary history of the components of RNA viruses, or of RNA viruses themselves, is hindered firstly by the high level of mutation, which very rapidly erodes the information containing their sequences. And uh, I have a very good example of what was for many, many years a wonderful, it's a still a wonderful paper published by the French group by Marc de la Rue et al. at Institut Pasteur. And here you can see the attempt they did um, actually 30 years ago to try to figure out the ancestral uh, RNA polymerase, uh, monomeric RNA polymerase for these different viruses. Every line here corresponds to the sequence of uh, the RNA polymerase of these different viruses. And you can see that very, very few amino acids are conserved. And that certainly hinders very strongly our attempts to understand the uh, structure, the properties of the ancestral RNA polymerase. But, but as you all know, we not only have uh, the primary sequences uh, of proteins to analyze, but we have an increasingly larger um, uh, set that database of uh, 
three dimensional structure of polymerases and of many other uh, proteins, of course. And when dealing with the monomeric um, RNA polymerases, in fact, dealing with the monomeric uh, polymerases in general, one can use for most of them the so called right hand model of polymerases. And here you have the case of um, the HIV1 reverse transcriptase. The red uh, part uh, corresponds to the thumb in the right hand model. The uh, yellow um, part section domain corresponds to the so-called fingers, and both of these uh, domains are engaged in the interaction with the template and the substrate. And the oldest and most conserved both in sequence and in a structure uh, domain corresponds to the so-called palm domain, which is precisely the catalytic um, component of, uh, of polymerases. Now one can compare the three-dimensional structure, the 3D structure of different polymerases, and you can see that most of them are clearly part of a monophyletic group. Uh, you can see here the RNA-dependent RNA polymerases. It, they, they read RNA, they form RNA. Here you have the reverse transcriptases, like in the case of HIV. They read DNA and form DNA. And you have here the DNA-dependent DNA polymerases that we see in E. coli in the different families. And in all cases, you see this same right-hand model that is clearly telling us that um, they are monophyletic. They originated once and they diverge. One can make comparisons as we did in the lab using a uh, technique that uh, was developed mostly by Rodrigo Jacome as part of his, of his PhD thesis. And here you have the uh, phylo phylogeny that results from a number of viral and cellular polymerases, all of them single um, um, monomeric ones. Down here we have the DNA pole, DNA pole um, uh, polymerase, which is the replicative uh, polymerase in the case of uh, eukaryotes. Here uh, you have the DNA uh, pole A. Uh, then uh, here we have um, in, the, um, in green the reverse transcriptase. And uh, finally, you see here in this branch, all of which are derived actually from, from, the, from the same ancestral molecule. Here you have both double stranded uh, polymerases, the monomeric uh, polymerases that can read and uh, replicate double stranded DNA or double stranded RNA or single stranded RNA. Uh, in other words, the uh, DNA polymerases are lack um, polymerases in general, monomeric polymerases lack a strict substrate and um, a template specificity. And uh, we are proposing actually that here we're looking at the descendants of the ancestral monomeric uh, RNA polymerase that was uh, engaged in the replication of cellular RNA genomes. Now, as you can see here, we are looking only at the phylogeny of the monomeric uh, RNA polymerases themselves, but uh, um, with no um, component engage in the editing and repair of the nucleic acid they are repairing. And because of the absence of the editing and repair mechanisms, RNA viral genomes typically have very small sizes. If you accumulate too many mutations, you lose your genetic identity. The only known example that we know uh, as of today of um, Editing mechanisms is in find, found in coronaviruses, in, which have an RNA genome, but they are known to encode a 3 prime 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 exonuclease, the so-called exon domain, which has led to a rather significant increase in the size of the genome as compared to other RNA viruses. And this is clearly shown in this graph, in which you have here the size of the different genomes for uh, different RNA viruses. You can see that most RNA viruses have a small genomes that go from like 3,000 to about 12, uh, 14, uh, 15,000 ribonucleotides. But when you look at the coronaviruses, you see a huge jump in the dimension. The current SARS-CoV-2 is actually, uh, has a genome of about 30,000 ribonucleotides. So clearly this can be understood, um, understood thanks to the editing activity of the exonuclease. Now, all of us, I'm sure, are quite familiar with the DNA exonuclease activity, which is very simple, actually. You have a template that's being read and replicated by a DNA polymerase, and it can, there can be a mistake either by the polymerase or 
because we have the cito, keto, and all or amino amino transitions of the bases. Uh, and if the polymerase, uh, in DNA polymerases, uh, um, wrong right, um, nucleotide is placed at the three prime end of the replicate, at the being at the synthesized, the unit synthesized. Um, a, a DNA strand. Very rapidly, the three prime, five prime exonuclease comes into action, hydrolyzes the phosphodiester backbone. This goes away, it's rapidly recycled, and then the polymerase can proceed and replicate the DNA without any problem. Now, we have a very, very good idea of the properties of these exonuclease uh, domains. Uh, for instance, for the E. coli DNA pol 3 here we have in very precise detail the uh, crystal structure of this domain, which is covalently joined, uh, joined to the rest of the of the polymerase. Now, because we have that um, a structure, and because we have the structure of the coronaviral uh, exonucleases, we can actually uh, make a superimposition of them, and you can see quite clearly that they are homologous. You can see quite clearly that the three-dimensional structure of the SARS-CoV-2, well, this is the case of the SARS-CoV-1 exonuclease domain, is clearly homologous to that of the DNA pol tree. When one looks at the different crystal structures available for the exon domain, which has a length of about 300 amino acids. You can see it here for the E. coli DNA pol 3. You see it here for the fake T7, which is a double-stranded DNA virus. If you see it here for the Lassa virus, the exo, Lassa virus exon um, uh, uh, and, and domain, and this is an RNA uh, virus. And here you have it for the uh, SARS-CoV-1, again, an RNA viruses. And once again, we can make without any problem, uh, phylogen is comparing the 3D structures. We have done so in a paper that we have just submitted, which is the work of Adrian Cruz Gonzalez and a number of, of us. And what you have here is a phylogeny based on the 3D of the crystal structures of all the exonucleases that are available. All of these will, uh, the gray, the phosphodiester backbone at the three prime end of uh, either RNA or DNA. Most of them are cellular, but here you have, for instance, the branches that correspond to double-stranded DNA fakes. In other words, here we have the exonuclease um, phylogenetic relationship to other exonucleases, and this uh, exonuclease is actually uh, editing um, a DNA. Uh, in DNA, double-stranded DNA viruses. Here you have the position of the exonuclease encoded by the RNA viruses, and here it's actually destroying, munching up, if you wish, the uh, phosphodiester back uh, uh, bond at the end of an RNA that's just being synthesized. And here you have uh, the coronavirus, the exonuclease domain, which is also an RNA viruses. So what we are seeing here is that at least three times in the history of uh, biology, uh, three times viruses have hijacked the uh, exo and domain. So one can say that the hijacking of three prime, five prime nucleases has taken it place, place at least three times by DNA fakes, T29, T4, T7, and by RNA viruses and coronaviruses, which have RNA genomes. In other words, exonuclease catalytic activity includes both RNA and DNA substrates. And this is important because if once you have an exonuclease, and there must have appeared one very early in cellular evolution, a transition from an RNA substrate or a DNA wouldn't, wouldn't have caused that much of a problem. And now, if we look at the cellular genomes nowadays, we see a whole array, uh, very complex molecular machinery engaged in the repair and the uh, editing activity when DNA uh, replicates. And of course, this has led to a huge uh, uh, increase in the size of cellular genomes. And when one looks at the cellular genomes, uh, one can clearly see that there are many, many um, multi-gene families which indicate that gene duplication events took place and were in involved in the size increase of cellular genomes. But in RNA viral genomes, multi-gene families uh, are not seen. 
uh, which means, of course, that in principle, gene duplications could occur, but their preservation is not favorable. Why? Because we have this very high level of mutation that will rapidly erode the evolutionary history provided by the sequences. But once again, we have three-dimensional structures that we have compared, and we have a paper that will probably be accepted. We're undergoing the, the review, a very favorable review, as submitted to virus evolution. And here you have, for instance, a comparison that done by Alejandro Cisneros Martinez, also from my lab, in which he compared the toxin that's encoded by the double-stranded RNA virus that attack with Stilago, the fungi, with Lacoche, which is a Mexican delicacy, um, and uh, the toxin, and when you will compare the uh, alpha and the beta subunit to clearly show that it is the outcome also, uh, they are the outcome of a gene duplication event. So, in conclusion, I think we can say that we are working under the assumption that the DNA pol 1, 2, 4, and the monomeric RNA polymerases may be vestiges of the ancestral proteinic polymerase from the RNA protein world. That gene duplication or recombination may have taken play, may have played a key role in the size increase of RNA cellular genomes. And as suggested by the extant exon domain, a key event in the evolution of genomes, of uh, cellular genomes, must have been the early emergence of an array of editing and repair activities. And we posit that actually the first one to appear, the easier one to appear, is the exon nuclease domain. And just to finish, let me give the list of all the members of the lab. Some of them are no more uh, with us, not because they have passed away, but because they have moved elsewhere, including, of course, Claudia Alvarez Carreño, who was very graciously accepted as a postdoc in, um, in Georgia Tech. And the work I have described in one way or another has been possible thanks to all the people listed here. And that's it. Thank you very much.